Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the April 2024 update in terms of what's happening in our region, our happy region of the world. Um, we're in a time right now of real uh, chaos. Uh, and everything's been turned over, uh, you know, not only with, you know, in the Gaza war, but in the wake of the Gaza war. And what I thought I'd do today is to try to at least describe the chaos <laughs> and, uh, and see where, where, where we're going, uh, you know, towards the end. You know, we're in a kind, you know, I have this, uh, you know, from my American background, uh, and maybe the British share this poem, the poem of Humpty Dumpty. You know, that probably nobody else knows outside of the United States and, and the UK. Humpty Dumpty, you know, uh, I think was a political poem probably from the, the Middle Ages. But it's about an egg named Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. This egg, Humpty Dumpty. Uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty together again. And I think that's a, a very good description of where we are today. Um, the egg has been broken uh, and you can't really put it together. Um, you know, Israel's invasion of Gaza has really gone out of control. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, the, the maybe shock and awe, but what the conception was in the beginning but the idea of destroying Gaza completely, I know Israel had to you know, get at the underground tunnels. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, just a total destruction of Gaza. And, you know, we're still waiting on the Rafah part of it, you know, makes no sense whatsoever in terms of any post-conflict kind of a situation. Where are you going with all of that? In other words, Israel has made Gaza uninhabitable, and that can't be put together. I don't see the international community coming in and building houses and infrastructure and roads and ports and an economy that will support, again, the 2.3 million people of Gaza. I just don't, you know, after every Israeli assault and destruction of Gaza, there's been international conferences in Sharm el-Sheikh or wherever it is in the Middle East. And the international donors come in and they promise billions of dollars and it never materializes. And what little does materialize is destroyed by Israel six months after it's built. So I don't think the donors, even if they were willing to put the money in, are going to put the money in knowing that all everything they're going to build is going to be destroyed again by Israel. Israel certainly has no capability of rebuilding Gaza, no interest in rebuilding Gaza. In, in fact, Israel has never put a penny and has never been asked by the international community to put in a penny in terms of repairing any of the destruction that is caused, whether it's in Gaza or in the West Bank. So for Israel, it destroys Gaza, it does whatever it does with Hamas, and then it walks away. That's Israel's idea. Uh, but um, there's no one to pick up the slack. And so Gaza is going to remain an open I don't know, it's certainly more than a humanitarian crisis. I mean, this whole idea of trying to reduce Gaza to some humanitarian crisis also, you know, avoids the political part of it. Israel is not going to destroy Hamas. And in fact, uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, Israel withdrew most of its troops from Khan Yunus and the central part of, of, of Gaza. Now, it says that, Israel says it's continuing its plans to attack Gaza, Rafah. It wants to still invade Rafah, and then it's pulling its forces out in order to rest them and retrain them. Uh, but at, at some point, they're going to be posed to go back in. I'm not sure that's possible. I don't think it's possible, actually, because I think once they're out uh, and once time passes, with all the international pressure, including the United States, not to go into Rafah, um, I don't think Israel's going to be able to do it. And so, in a way, the war has turned, and Israelis are talking about this, there's a lot of anger about it, into a pointless a pointless round of destruction for everybody. Um, you know, Israel did not achieve any of its goals. 
It didn't destroy Hamas. It didn't destroy Hamas's military capability, not to mention its, its political relevance. If anything, its political relevance has risen because, uh, I mean, uh, maybe not in Gaza today, but certainly in the West Bank and elsewhere, Gaza, uh, Hamas is much more popular with the, with the masses as a resistance group than is Fatah. Even if the people don't accept the Hamas religious ideology, uh, you know, it's seen as a, as, as a resistance group more popular than Fatah. So you can't really have elections in the Palestinian territory. So now we're stuck with Abu Mazen and that crew. And that's a non-starter in terms of, uh, of anything else, including trying to reform the PA or trying to get a new collaborationist regime in place. In other words, all those plans sort of don't work out. Going back to Gaza, then, Israel not only didn't destroy Hamas and its military capacity, its political um, status, and uh, and the and and it, it and its its military infrastructure, it didn't release the hostages. There are reports now, and even Hamas is sort of indicating this, that of the 139 hostages, there are probably less than 40 that are still alive. So regardless of what happens, Israel might get back a few, but the likelihood right now is that maybe no hostages are coming back. We'll see the, 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 the talks are in, in Egypt today. But Israel has failed. Whatever comes out, Israel has failed to get the hostages back. That was a prime uh, goal. Um, uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, um, Israel has lost its international standing. I think the floodgates have been opened. You know, once it becomes legitimate to criticize Israel, and the criticism has come now from the tops of governments all the way down through the people, uh, and especially the young generation coming out in the streets, I think Israel's lost it. I don't think it can put that together again either. I don't think it'll have its um, uh, Teflon, you know, criticism-proof uh, international standing anymore. I don't think governments can support it very well anymore. Uh, and so where that's going, we'll have to see, because, of course, uh, we have to remember that the big agenda for Biden, for the United States, for Europe, uh, has not been Palestine. This has been, this was a, and this in a way shows to some degree the power of what we call terrorism, um, October 7th. You know, if October 7th had not happened, if Hamas had not succeeded in penetrating Israel and attacking as it did, regardless of the form it took, the Palestinians would have been erased by now as any kind of a political factor. In other words, if we remember Netanyahu was standing in front of the UN with a map of greater Israel from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, saying in the next week or two, we are going to sign the normalization deal with Saudi Arabia, and then it's over. There's a new Middle East. And that new Middle East, of course, that was being pushed by Biden in Europe has nothing to do with Palestinians. Palestinians were absolutely marginalized until uh, October 7th. So, you know, anybody that says uh, terrorism uh, is illegitimate as a tool of warfare, and it's always been used as a tool of warfare by every army. Um, certainly has been proven wrong in terms of October 7th because Hamas changed absolutely the political map. And what it did was it made, at least for the time being, normalization impossible. Because, uh, you know, as autocratic as the Arab states are, they still have public opinion. And the obviously the public opinion in the streets of the Arab world and of the wider Muslim world and today of Europe and uh, Latin America and Asia, you know, throughout the world is tremendously pro-Palestinian. I mean, Palestinian has really become this global issue that has galvanized people all over the world from governments down to, to the street and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the rest of the pro-Arab, uh, the pro-Western Arab countries cannot normalize with Israel, you know, uh, and disregard their own public opinion the way they could have before October 7th. That's a huge change because for in the bigger geopolitical picture, 
normalization was really the end goal because the big issues in the Middle East are trying to challenge China. If you remember uh, a week or two before October 7th, Biden at the G20 meeting um, announced uh, IMAC, the India Middle East Corridor, that would be a new economic corridor going through Israel. Actually, Haifa would become the, the hub between India and everything in between and Saudi Arabia and the Arab world and Europe. It would all funnel through Haifa port as the this, this IMAC project as a counterweight to the Belt and Road project of the Chinese. This is what really normalization meant. The Chinese, the Russians, the BRICS countries, don't forget Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have joined BRICS now. So, so there's a real challenge here to Western hegemony in this crucial Middle Eastern region. And in fact, internal threats, even from Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. You know, what does it mean? That on the one hand, they're getting nuclear arms from the West, and on the other hand, they're in bricks with China. So, uh, you know, and in so there's that's the struggle going on. And within that context, Palestine means nothing. It has no. And, and in fact, the idea was of Israel, the United States, the Arab world, everyone, that the Palestinians could be marginalized, were being marginalized. And with the collaborators, collaborationist leadership of uh of the Palestinian Authority and Abu Mazen, they were they would they would fit into that as well. And so, and so where we were, and in a way where we have to get back to from that point of view, is what Biden calls the two-state solution. Don't for, this is this is their idea of how do we re-marginalize the Palestinians and get on with this really bigger, more important agenda of uh, of uh, ensuring Western hegemony in the Middle East. And that is the two-state solution, which has always been the solution of governments because it's always been a great conflict management tool. You could say we're for Palestinian rights, we're for negotiations, we want a just peace, and, and, and then keep the whole process of nothing happening, managing this conflict going on forever. That changed on October 7th. Hamas destroyed that mechanism of conflict management. Nevertheless, it's the only thing, unless you really talk about a just solution, a just resolution to the Israel-Palestinian issue, one that really gives Palestinians their national rights, that really gives them access to the entire country, really a one-state solution that brings the refugees back and really gives the Palestinians, uh, uh, you know, a measure of their sovereignty, of, of national integrity, of a future for their children and so on, together with Israelis, of course. But nevertheless, nevertheless, a, a genuinely bring the Palestinians into an equal position with Israelis in this country, unless you do that, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. You can't do that because that would mean actually destroy, not destroying Israel. That's not true. It would mean transforming Israel. Uh, Israel cannot exist as a Jewish state, a colonial state on 85 percent of Palestine with its settlements and have any kind of resolution to the Palestinian issue. It has to be apartheid. It, there has to be an apartheid reality in any resolution that keeps Israel intact, even a two-state solution that somehow pushes Israel back to 67, that's not going to happen, has to be an apartheid situation. And and so <clears throat> and and that is unacceptable to all of us. And so what Biden is going to attempt to do, and and this is where we have to be on, we have to be the watchdog. We have to be the ones that speak out. He's said this already, is as soon as the fighting subsides, he's going to initiate a two-state uh, program. But it really is two-state apartheid. Because what it means is Israel will expand in, in, onto, onto the West Bank, because that's where its major settlements are. Israel's already annexed Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. And you're going to get 
the Palestinians that are half the population of the country locked into three or four small enclaves in the West Bank and, and a, a destroyed Gaza that I don't see how it's ever going to be rehabilitated. And in order to sweeten the pot, <clears throat> in other words, how do we make apartheid somehow, if not acceptable to Palestinians, sweet enough that this collaboration's leadership and the Arab governments can accept it so we can get on to normalization. Well, you know, we might make it cosmetically nicer. For example, this is the idea of, of thickening Gaza. Israel will give a little bit of the Negev desert to Gaza so that it looks a little bit bigger and it can have, uh, you know, a, a larger population maybe, but it still remains a ghetto, uh, an open air prison. Um, Israel might, um, um, Israel might uh, make concessions in terms of uh, trade between Israel and this Palestinian Bantustan, open its borders a little bit. The United States and the Arab countries could put in $50 billion to buy off everybody. And there's all kinds of ways to sweeten the pot. The point is there has to be an apartheid two-state situation uh, uh, unless the United States and Europe and the Arab world are willing to go along with what I believe the vast majority of the people want, certainly the Palestinian people, and that is one democratic state. In other words, we're back to the idea that there has to be a political solution, and any political solution has to see Israel transformed, Israel and the Occupy territory, the whole territory between the river and the sea, transformed into a democratic state of equal rights for everyone that gives expression to the different national identities that exist, that brings back the refugees. In other words, even if the Palestinians haven't completely formulated and articulated and come behind this kind of a plan, this is where we're going. This is where we have to go because the choice is stark, apartheid or, or one democratic state. And we're going to be bucking the big forces in terms of this because that means, and this is a very difficult, almost unprecedented thing for the international community, um, that a member of the United Nations, Israel, disappears from the map and is transformed into whatever the name of the new state will be, Palestine, Israel, Canaan, uh, Humusville. I mean, who knows what it'll be called? But there will be a new state uh, in the world, and there has to be a new state. Uh, so that <clears throat> that's the only way that the egg, the egg will never be put together, but hopefully we'll have a new egg that'll be, but but remaining within the, the, the present paradigm of an Israel that exists, an Israel apartheid state that oppresses Palestinians, is allowed to destroy Gaza. Um, you know, that that contributes militarily and politically to the instability of this region. Uh, it, it's simply uh, it's simply a, an unsustainable kind of a of a situation that can never be made sustainable anymore. We can't put the egg together again. And therefore, I think our job as extra parliamentary people, the, the international community, we, that support Palestinian rights, my bottom line is the, the only way we can salvage this mess and turn it into something positive is by working with the Palestinians and with critical Israelis to formulate a political program of one democratic state, including the right of return of refugees, and beginning to push that onto our governments. That, I think, is our task. Uh, it, it's not easy for the Palestinians to do that because they are so scattered and so dispersed and so marginalized on purpose. But I think they're beginning to work towards that direction. There's talks even of trying to revitalize the PLO or some other Palestinian liberation vehicle. Uh, and we have to support that. So those are my thoughts, kind of rambling maybe this morning. But I think the, the, the direction is clear. We, we're not going to go back to the status quo ante, and we have to go forward, and the only way forward is one democratic state. So those are my thoughts. 
for the month and let's see what May brings us. Bye everyone.